Oh, I almost started it. I almost started it before we hit record. But here we are in Goal Radio, the podcast presented by the Hockey Shop. Source for Sports Surrey, thehockeyshop.com. Use them as your resource to get you on the ice and keep you in top shape uh, as you perform and stopping all those pucks. Uh, Derek Millard, along with the co-founders of Ingoal Magazine, Kevin Whitley and David Hutchison. Gentlemen, we are at the point where it's the last edition before the National Hockey League regular season starts, and we're going to go through uh, some of the names that are performing well during this NHL preseason. And then I want your pick for the Vesna Trophy, but there is a caveat. You cannot say Andre Vasilevsky. Because everybody will just cop out to Andre Vasilevsky with good reason. But you can't say, Andre, I want to know who else you would pick. And we might get, I'm going to even give you two picks. And we might get six different names uh, through it. Uh, gentlemen, are, are you enjoying the uh, the preseason, Hutch? Uh, what, what you're seeing out there, all the different looks, all the different uh, players and news places? It's uh it's hard to get used to after that goalie carousel this summer, isn't it? It's uh it's a lot to pick up, it's a lot new, but it's really exciting to to see these guys back on the ice and to anticipate what's coming and just that opportunity to have chit chats like this, like who's gonna win the Vesna or do we have a goalie in the Calder race this year? Uh it's the most exciting time of year until puck drop happens for me and and I'm enjoying every bit of it. Woody, how about you? Uh, yeah, but see, mine's a little tempered because I got to sit through it some nights in person and don't necessarily have a paycheck at the end of it because we don't cover the preseason. Uh, access hasn't quite been as exciting as I was hoping it would be to some of the goalies post game. We're not in the rooms, but I'm still excited to see the regular season start. So that was my tempered. And th- it's a preseason, right? Darren almost th- forgot to hit Rick. Record. Oh, you're just a vet sitting in the box, so you're. I'm just old yeah. and grumpy, right? But no, no, I'm excited. I'm jacked for the start of the regular season. I uh, got to see Seattle come through here. Talk to Grubauer. He threw out a little sense arena plug for us there in the conversation post game. 38 save shutout against the Vancouver Canucks, and uh, the beat reporter asked him what he was like, how he stays focused and prepared now. Because they have a week off. Like, they're done their preseason. Like, three or four. Yeah, that's a bizarre schedule. They just got it out of the way. And now they got a whole week to practice for their opener against Vegas. And so, Gruby was asked how he's, how he's going to stay sharp. And yeah, he gave an answer about practice. And I kind of whispered on the side, maybe a little sensory. And he's like, oh, yeah, I've been trying to get on it. So, you know, a week without games, he can still see pro shots in practice and in his apartment or condo or wherever the hell he's living in Seattle. So, um, starts for real on Tuesday, your Vegas Golden Knights, Darren, against the Seattle Kraken. I think the Kraken are going to be a very goalie friendly environment. I said 38 shots against Grubauer, um, an absolute blitz on one of the power plays. He had nine shots on one power play and three or four of them were good looks. But outside of that at five on five, man, they controlled the defensive environment. That was a goaltender's dream. Part of that may be in the opposition. The Canucks had half of an AHL lineup in there, but so it's kind of hard to read preseason, right? Like, yeah, Gruby came in with an 857 save percentage and people scratching their heads. He leaves it with like a 932 and everybody's like, he's ready for the season. Like, these guys are playing in front of lineups they're not used to, different personnel on the back end that aren't going to be there when the season starts. You got to take a major grain of salt with all of it. But still, I'm, I'm sorry. You lost me when you started quoting preseason save percentage numbers. Like, I, uh, you, you <laughs> lost me on that. I've. Uh, in my entire career, I've never tracked preseason save percentage numbers. Well, you asked me to look up stats, Darren. I looked up stats. <laughs> no, I just said, give me give me your Vezina Trophy winner, and you can't say Andre Vasilevsky. Are you not worried about Russ, though, like not playing for a week uh, uh, for the Seattle Kraken? And, 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 and don't forget, Hutch, uh, you would know this uh, as somebody of my vintage. This is, a, this is an, a team or an organization. Like Seattle hasn't played an NHL game in 100 years. There's got to be some rust in there. There's a bit of rust yeah, there, yeah. Uh, there's- so, so are you suggesting you and I are both of the vintage that we saw them play their last game? <laughs> well, we're closer. We're closer to it. <laughs> <laughs> I think guys were still stuffing magazines in their shins but back when they last played a game. Magazines weren't even published then. I don't know what they were yeah, stuffing the in. The original Seattle uh, NHL pro gear segment <laughs> from Kevin Woodley. <laughs> We'll feature tips for dressing up your cricket pads as you hit the ice. <laughs> so Cam, Cam, get the hockey shop, the hockey shop.com gear segment with Cam uh, in 19, 
1920. Uh, so we we've got uh, some names that I that I want to throw up, but but let's start with just uh, our best wishes to Carey Price. Uh, he has uh, admitted himself to the player assistance program, and uh, it it did sound like Mark Bergevin was uh, a little bit surprised uh, by by what uh, what occurred because Carey had been around the facility and uh, didn't appear that there was. Uh, anything untoward uh, happening, but uh, Kerry's going to get himself healthy. He's going to be allowed at least uh, 30 days. Jake Allen uh, is going to be the the guy that takes over in the goaltending front. But uh, but boy, uh, I just think big picture, gentlemen, if Kerry Price can take care of his mind along with his body like this and go through this process, boy, I think it, it offers great uh, motivation for anybody else that that's going through it and uh to to make sure that they they follow through and angela's tweet uh, his wife's tweet was was a great example of that yeah and i think he's been the face of that montreal franchise for so long uh he's been the face like for ccm for the longest time like like i think in the hockey world people see him as the montreal but like in the goalie world like he's the guy right like he is there is yeah. no more prominent voice and so to have the bravery knowing the spotlight that you command and knowing the attention that will come with that decision to have the bravery to make it and make it publicly, um, you know, will probably just as Robin Lehner has done in in Vegas, will probably inspire other people to feel more comfortable vocalizing or getting help when they need it from a mental health component. So, um, uh, you know, kudos to him for being that brave and. You know, just all our thoughts are with him. He's he's meant so much to the hockey world, to the goalie world. Um, he's such a great person. We've had time, chance to spend time with him and his family and his dad. You just want good things for all of them, and so hopefully he gets the time to 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 find that that peace and the, and whatever it is, just feel better. I think it just speaks to the fact that we're in such a better place as a society now that there was such a warm outpouring of support as soon as this was announced. And I just find it incredibly encouraging. Uh, really thankful that that's how people have responded. Obviously, we wish him well. This really has the potential to help so many more people. Just that people will see the response to carry and will understand it's okay to reach out for help. Uh, this He's going to help so many people through this. Uh, obviously, himself and his family first and foremost. But but uh, I'm just really encouraged by the whole thing, guys. I've got, a, I've got this uh, phrase that, uh, that a nurse talked to me about one time. Uh, cold cancer, stubbed toe, strained ligament, uh, anxiety, depression. It's all the same. Like if, if you suffer yeah. from any of it, you're going to, if you bang your knee up, you're going to seek treatment. If you suffer from anxiety, you're going to seek treatment. It's all, it all falls under the same umbrella of, uh, of taking care of your body and taking care of your, your, your mind. And, um, and there's no reason why the mind should not be considered part of your body, because as far as I know, there's a neck there that attaches them. I think so. And uh, just confirming that. And uh, so take care of it. And uh, yeah, I think that this will have uh, implications uh, and and fallout uh, that we'll be feeling for a long time in a very, very positive way. And uh, we can't wait to see Carey Price back uh, on the ice. Uh, Jake Allen takes over, as mentioned. So uh, they are in uh, in good hands with with Jake, and uh, boy, they put some money in their goaltending. And uh, from a hockey perspective, that's a really good decision. Uh, the last two years for the Montreal Canadiens, Kevin. Yeah, and it'd be interesting to see. I, I'm kind of fascinated. Like, like to me, Jake's a known entity, right? Like, we know why they made that investment. It paid off last year in terms of him taking over and helping getting them to the playoffs. Carey getting more rest during the year. But interesting that they claim Sam Montembeau off waivers from the Florida Panthers before this happens. Um, I think it was with the expectation Kerry wouldn't be able to maybe start the season, but for other reasons, obviously, because as, as you said, Mark Bergevin was caught off guard um, by the announcement yesterday. Uh, but interesting that they go get that rather than Caden Primo, who you know looked like maybe he was ready to take a step. But you lose that buffer with Charlie Lindgren signing elsewhere in the offseason, and so They've they've kind of replaced it with a little more experience, and I'll be curious to see which which way they go there, sort of behind Jake. Because you know, um, if there's one thing we've learned, it's it can't be on one guy. You need to have options in that, and they're in the you know your arguably toughest division in hockey. So curious to see where that goes. Hey guys, one quick note here: we're ten minutes in. We haven't mentioned our feature guest, 
And I think oh. I think we need to because we have breaking news as we record this. Like Hutch has got to find a some type of sound like doo, 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 breaking news. Yaroslav Halak. I think that was pretty good. Yaroslav Halak, featured guest on this week's Ingo Radio podcast, has been named as one of the first three players um, that will be on the Slovakia Olympic team for the 2022 game. So we did, he didn't want to talk much in this interview we've got coming up about the Olympics yet, um, but he's going to be there. And that makes an interesting situation for the Canucks who could also have Thatcher Demko there with the United States. Both guys might need a rest coming home. Wow, that's uh, that's great. Can you give me that breaking news uh, again just to, to bookend it? <clears throat> oh, no, that sounded, di- that sounded different. I was going into... <laughs> Kevin, that should be the new intro for Cam and Woody. That that should be going into the gear segment. Uh, this is what yeah. we're going to see a carnival uh, with Cam and uh, and Woodley over at the Source for Sports Surrey, the Hockey Shop, the Hockey Shop dot com. Yes, Yaroslav Halak is going to join us. A uh, really cool interview, and it does get into cleaning the pads. Uh, his game set and uh, why he wears a practice set and the entire story right back to his Montreal days and how it got started. So that part is really cool, along with uh, what he's trying to accomplish at this stage of his career. Uh, here's a guy that's uh, played uh, Montreal, St. Louis, uh, Boston, who am I uh, leaving out? Washington. The Islanders. Uh, the Islanders. Um, yeah. So there's, there's, uh, it's been uh, a journey. Yeah, 300, 300 wins is something he talks about chasing. That's a big milestone for him, big milestone for any goaltender in the National Hockey League. And uh, great stuff. I can't wait to share this one with you a little later in the show, uh, especially for a guy who we talk about, when did you have your first goalie coach? Well, how about how your first goalie coach being a Saturday afternoon highlight show back in Slovakia where you just watched all the NHL guys? So he shares some tidbits about that and that, sh- that weekly highlight show that he used to sort of you know, learn how to play the position in those formative years. So it's, it's a great interview and uh, I'm looking forward to sharing it. Yeah. And his passion for that highlight show shines through. Like it, he went back to it a couple of times and it's just boom, right there, uh, right there. I'm going to throw out some names to you uh, and just give me a, a, an assessment or a first thought uh, about what you're seeing. Uh, ben Bishop, I'm just a, a little add on here. Woodley is he, will not play at all during the preseason. So I, I, I think despite the fact none of us knew what his status was and the fact that he was trying to come back, if you look at the moves made by Dallas in the offseason, in particular the addition of Braden Holpe, given the fact they already had Jake Otinger and, and Anton Hudobin, uh, as well as Bishop, kind of told you this should have been expected or they were at least anticipating the possibility. Now, to me, what's interesting, and, and Bishop's health, you know, if, he, if and when he comes back, will, will play a role in what that depth chart looks like long term. But to me, the interesting part of this is Braden Holtby, because it, again, preseason stats, Darren, I know I'm not supposed to talk about it, but just f- how about form? And on form, Braden Holtby looked very good in his first two appearances to the point where not me, but the people in Dallas were talking about him potentially making a run at that job. Now, Anton Hudobin's also had a good start since that night, but um, Braden talked afterwards about some of the changes he made here. And we talked about this last year in Vancouver, how he made a lot of changes to his game and then just never had an opportunity to be comfortable with them because there was no preseason. And for him, that's so important to get the chance to play with things without the pressure of win wins and losses. Like once the season starts, especially with the start Vancouver got up to, like they were behind the eight ball right and right away and chasing it, there was no margin for error. So you, you can't try new things in a game, right? You're like, you're gonna, it's like the golfer who makes a swing change and all of a sudden he's in contention on the back nine on a Sunday in a tournament and the old swing comes back under pressure. You're going to revert to what you've been doing for, you know, 10 plus years in your career. So um, but there was signs late in the season that it was... Be- yeah, when they came off that pause, yeah. right? I mean, that game against Toronto that he was finally getting comfortable blending the old and the new because you don't want to lose the old in brain, the instincts, the reads, all those elements. But he was getting comfortable mixing those two worlds finally. And then in the off season, don't forget, the bio didn't happen until later. We've heard this from Markstrom. We've heard this from Thatcher Demko. We heard it a few weeks ago from Thatcher Demko. After the first year with Ian Clark, there were positions and movements 
that both of those guys couldn't quite get their body into comfortably. And they both went into the offseason and fixed that and then came back and were able to execute much better. Sounds like talking to people behind the scenes, Braden did the same thing this summer in terms of his hips and range of motion and did a lot of work on that. So you got a guy who spent the year trying to make changes and it didn't really click till late. Um, You got a guy that spent the offseason trying to get his body to the point where those changes would be easier to initiate and execute this season. And you got a guy who, I'd be honest with you, this is the first time since Braden Holtby lifted the Stanley Cup that he's had a decent defense in front of him. Washington's defense evaporated after Barry Trotz left in terms of their discipline and structure. He Two years ago, his last year in Washington, he had one of the lowest expected save percentages in the National Hockey League. And to call the Canucks defensively a tire fire last year would be an insult to tire fires. They were dead last in the NHL in terms of their expected numbers and the amount of high quality chances they gave up by clear sight analytics. They were the worst team in the National Hockey League defensively. Dallas ain't that. They're the other end of the spectrum. And so you got all these changes and you've got a goalie who has always read the game at an elite level. And now he's in a a more predictable environment where those reads should actually happen as opposed to making the read. And then the defenseman doesn't do what he's supposed to do. Like what's happening here. Like I don't want to get ahead of myself because I'm a big Hudobin guy, but I think you could see a really good season. A really good season for Braden Holtby, a guy that a lot of people, I think, were ready to write off after this last one and after the buyout. How can you talk for that long just about one guy? It's kind of like the, the, that, oh, it's the Thatcher Demko interview, right? Like, this is, and this is, this is, this is the difference. This is why I lament what, why I got grumpy about the way it looks like in the preseason. When you get to watch guys on a regular basis and have conversations with them, that that's the level you can get into. And it's been harder this past year to do that. So, so I only really have that level left with the guys I see every day, right? So hopefully we can get back to getting more of those conversations around the league. So so I can talk for 10 minutes about anyone, guys. <laughs> Poor Buck. I, I've loved the Poor preseason Bucks. because I've loved being able to to be able to see some of the prospects play uh, a little bit more and get in into the lineup. The names that you see, if you're tracking uh, box scores uh, in and around or organizational depth charts and be able to watch them uh, in in a game environment. Uh, one of those guys that we do know a, a lot about, but has changed teams, uh, Laurent Persois. Uh, Hutch uh, has landed in Vegas. He's got a shutout in the preseason and a couple of wins. Yeah, well, you're going to have more to add to this than I am, I think, Darren, having seen it close up so much more than I have. But I, as you know, for a long time, I've I've seen that as a, Fantastic signing by Vegas and an incredible opportunity for LB as well. Uh, we think he's an outstanding goaltender. He's done some great things in the opportunities he's had more recently in Winnipeg. Um, and I think was a guy who showed that he deserved uh, a greater chance. And I think he's going to get that in Vegas. Um, obviously, he's with Robin Lehner. He's got an outstanding number one that he's playing with. But I think we've also seen that that Laner's probably unlikely to play the same number of games that uh, Connor Hellebuck would in Winnipeg. So I think LB is going to get a chance here to uh, maybe go on a little bit of a run here and there and and show what what he's capable of. And er- early signs so far in the preseason seem to show that it's working well for him. M- maybe even we could point to his save percentage, Woody. I, I'd have to look that up, though. It, it, no, no, he's not. Doing that, that would be a nine fifty. Uh, uh, that's okay. There you go. I'd take that any day. <laughs> with just for you, with Darren. One uh, perfect game. Uh, when when you look at Boston, Tuka Rask uh, is out, and there's a great competition for the number one job with the Bruins, and a player that I admit I didn't know anything about until he appeared on In Goal Radio, the podcast, and that's Jeremy Swayman, who has really grabbed everybody's attention and made that a competition. Uh, uh, Hutch, uh, Woody, I mean, it, it's a real battle with Linus Allmark. Yeah, and you know, well, go ahead, Hutch. Sorry, buddy. No, no, I was I was going to toss it to you, Woody, because you know him better than I do, and you're the one who's had the relationship with him and with his college coach, Alfie Michaud, who was on the show last week. Uh, I just looking at the situation, I think it's a, an interesting dynamic. I, I know, Woody, you've talked so many times about how different it is when a goaltender goes from a pure backup role to a starter role and how that affects them. I think here we sort of have the middle step, don't we? When when Tuca's the starter, he knows he's he's the backup, and there won't be a great opportunity to play a ton of games. Now he's in a in a pure competition situation, so not having to carry the load as a starter, 
Um, but that opportunity to compete and to win some starts here this year, I think, is is there like it's never been before. So it's going to be a, an interesting dynamic. And I think the biggest thing is when, you know, yeah, and I haven't talked to him this season going into it early. I had some texts back and forth in the summer, but like Jeremy's mindset probably is just, you know, we always talk about one shot, one game at a time as the ultimate thing. Like he doesn't approach it that way. You know, he's not thinking, oh, I've got this great opportunity. He's just going in and playing, right? So, um, and I think one thing is people, especially in that market in Boston, goaltending becomes a hot button thing. And like, we're obviously big Jeremy Swayman fans, but you got to give Allmark some time um, to get comfortable behind a, a new defense and a new system and a new structure. And that's probably part of what you're seeing here too. Like the reality is, and what a, what a great opportunity to have a safety net like that as a team where you can let Swayman play more early and let I, Allmark get his feet wet because they're both going to be a big part of your future. And I mean, a fascinating situation to watch, right? Like we've seen the upside of Jeremy Swayman already. Allmark signed for four years and Tuca sitting in the background getting healthy probably by January or February saying he doesn't want to play anywhere else other than Boston. So, I mean, that situation is going to warrant eyeballs and undoubtedly going to generate conversation around that market. Um, you know, funny, we talked to Yara about just about Tuca during the interview coming up as well. And just, it's amazing sometimes the disrespect that guy gets in his own market for a future Hall of Famer. Um, they got three good ones there and I'm curious to see what's going to happen. Presented by Source for Sports Surrey, The Hockey Shop, thehockeyshop.com. Uh, this is In Goal Radio, the podcast. A couple of weeks ago in our gear segment, uh, Woody and Cam went through some uh, pro return sticks. Uh, I don't know whether you guys mentioned, I can't remember, uh, if there was any Mike Smith twigs in there. But if I get a Mike Smith pro return stick, can I shoot like him? I know that you, we, we had some great uh, information up on, on In Goal Magazine. And uh, for for premium uh, subscribers uh, about uh, puck handling, but the way he went for the empty net in the preseason, uh, he's a he's in mid season gambler form. Yeah, you know what? I don't think getting a mic. The, first of all, there aren't any Mike Smith pro returns, and there are. Make sure you check it out at thehockeyshop.com because they are finally going online. The sticks, um, new models being added. Uh, you know, kind of on a daily basis. Because as as we showed you in that video, like behind the scenes, there's just a huge wall of these pro return CCM sticks and some really great options, including some trigger grips you can try at the hockey shop and the hockey shop dot com. Um, no Mike Smith uh, and no, I don't think having one of his sticks would be enough, although the four part series at Ingle will help you at least get a little closer. But in addition to going for the empty net, and I'm actually almost surprised he missed because it was the perfect opportunity on top of the crease, bad dump in, like had a good look and just missed it. Uh, he had an apple in that game on the power play, quick up to dry sidle to McDavid to the back of the net. And I think he, he had a shot on goal, Hutch said, where he cleared the penalty kill zone right on the other net. And then he almost had another assist where I, I can't remember if it was a clear-cut breakaway he set up, but whether it was directly or indirectly, but he is at his puck moving best early. And if we ever get to our predictions for the season, I might have one around surrounding Mike Smith. Oh. Hutch, were you surprised he went for uh, it? I was just... <laughs> not at all. That was one of the best things in that series of videos that we uh, put up from this summer was Mike's advice to the young kids that you just have to have the courage to to go for it and he wasn't really talking about going for the empty net in that case uh he was just talking about having the courage to handle the puck and the the permission to make mistakes um but no of course not surprised at all i just don't think even if any of us got a mike smith pro return stick i don't think we could shoot it anywhere because that guy is an absolute physical beast he is like nothing any of us will ever be. So I don't think we could put a flex into that thing. So no chance. Oh, we're we're E-Flex yeah. guys. We we need that little extra whippy yeah. stick. He's a premier guy. He's an access guy. There's no chance we could bend oh, that oh, stick. We, I'd be we playing win. shuffleboard with that stick for sure. Puck Puck's not coming yeah. off the ice. That thing's probably like a rock. And you're right. Like I say this in with the utmost admiration. Mike Smith is a physical freak. Like he is an absolute physical freak. Anybody who's had a chance to like, he could probably play any, he probably play a whole bunch of different sports. He used to play a bunch of softball too, like slow pitch. And like, he's, he's a physical freak. Oh, I'm thinking. Yeah, tight I probably play that too. Yeah. He's just uh, so strong. And yeah, he's, it's crazy off the charts. Slot receiver. 
I'm going Canadian League. Going going there CFL go. slot receiver. Uh, let's get into the gear segment, and then we'll come back to our Vesna predictions uh, because I do want to slide over to Cam. And uh, now that we've been talked about the pro returns, uh, this week's gear segment uh, is the Bauer Elite chest protector as we dive into some upper body stuff uh, so slide over to the hockey shop source for sports story the hockey shop.com with woody and cam talking upper body welcome back to the hockey shop source for sports down here in the goalie utopia we i was gonna say the basement but this is Literally the opposite of the basement when it comes to the hierarchy of heaven and hell. This is goalie heaven, utopia as we call it. There's another joke in there somewhere where we're going to let it well, slide. Let's, let's not, I probably crossed a religious line already there, so let's just roll it back. We've got a couple of, uh, we've got a couple of surprises for you, some discounts, some sales, some specials. But first off, again, for a second straight week, we wanted to go down into the lower price point models. Last week, we did it with the CCM sticks and the 5.9. This week, we're going to the Bauer Elite Chest Protector. We've already talked about the new Hyperlite. A lot of really nice features in that model. But Cam, Bauer Elite. This is a model that's going to carry over for a few years. One more year. One. one more year. Okay, so this is one that is not necessarily the lower price point version of, say, the Hyperlite. But this is kind of a blend of the Vapor and Supreme lines that exists at that next price point. Walk me through the Bauer Elite chest protector and start with price point. Because I got to be honest with you, when I put this thing on, it felt not only like really mobile out of the box. I didn't have a hat on when I put it on. Added the hat, no problem. Why don't you show the audience how you can take your hat on and off? I think we've had enough hair jokes for the day. That wasn't even a hair joke. I was showing the mobility, the awesome mobility of the chest. Let's look at this wanted, demo right here. You just wanted me to give it one of those. I got him to do it. <laughs> okay, but as you can see, Extremely mobile, right out of the bat. Um, this is a fantastic $399 price point chest. It really is. And I mean, Kevin's now said it four or five times. It's like, wow, this feels really, really good. It also feels protective. Like where where are the different where am I gonna feel the differences? Um, like if you're out going out for skates with guys who play like pro, am I like what age group am I comfortable in this second price point? Because I gotta be honest, like the way it wraps and seals around the ribs, some of the extra layers of protection on the inside that just feels like an extra, like I feel really good in this chest protector. I mean, obviously you do got to lose some things, especially in comparison to, for example, that pro price point. So, you know, you're not going to feature the Curvex composite. You're not going to get their shock light material, especially for, you know, impacts right on that dead center of the chest. Now, don't get me wrong. This is actually an extremely protective unit for, again, that price point. Is it that elite level protection, even though it does say elite on it? No, it's not the pro unit. So if my son's playing junior A, I'm not looking at this. But if my son's playing major bantam, is this an option? However, however, and there are instances of, you know, that senior chest being used at that, what we call elitist level of hockey. You know, and there people are comfortable. It all comes down to your pain tolerance, number one. Uh, number two, your level of comfortability, what mobility you're looking for, what you find restrictive, not restrictive. You know what? Yes, technically it's not supposed to be, but I, I know of people using this at like some higher level of hockey for sure. And they're feeling comfortable. They're feeling protected. Um, adjustability is a real nice feature that this chest does have. So especially that growing kid, even in that midget uh, area where they're kind of crossing, you know, sizing, but they need a good level of protection, but they're, they're growing really quickly. Hold out your arm for a second. Adjustable Velcro in arms. By simply pulling that down or up, I get that level of adjustability. There's about an inch, inch and a half of playroom there. If I can pull that up, shoulder floaters on the back side of the chest, adjustable body, adjustable as well. Had that ability again, kind of really dial in that chest and fit it up the way you know you'd want it. Extendable belly pad and side pad. These come off or on again, depending on how the desired length, whether you tuck or don't tuck. This chest will do both very nicely. I'm just going to throw I mean, stuff just at throw you. some stuff at me. That's fine. I missed the tab. I missed the tab. Put it back on. I need all the protection I can get. But that said, for once again, $399, elite chest protector. Great option for sure. Um, however, because I always like to... I like the little tie down in the front. I love that. I like that. For those of us who tuck, depending on what you're wearing, like the ability to sort of cinch the pads to the front of the belly there. Love it. Great option. But I always like to have options. And if you're at that $399 price point and you happen to fit 
or be in the right size category for a couple of the ones that I have left. I still do have the Supreme 2S Pro and she's on for that exact same price of $399. So this one lives at $399. 2S Pro is normally a $679 unit. Obviously it's been replaced. Um, this is sort of last the last generation on the Supreme side in terms of the previous model. Ultrasonics put replaced it. Yep. Yeah. $399. For pro level chest. Like do the math, Cam. How much is that off? Uh, I don't know, 300 bucks? 280, but that's not bad for your level. But we have an even further option too. It's what we call derivative model in the mid-level chest vector, which was, again, a 399 chest. You have the Supreme S29 as well. So this was, this was the lower price point of that? Correct. I've got a few of these guys left over on sale. Uh, I believe we're in the 250 range off the top of my head. Nice features. Of course, these are all things that we've talked about in the past, in past years when they first came out, including that 2S Pro model. We had a lot of good feedback on that from our testers as well on the InGoal Magazine side. All right. So listen, lots of options we've given you here today. Really like this one in that second price point, Bowers Elite Chest Protector. This is sort of the current model, but also sale prices on the other one. If you've got any questions on what might be right for your game, not just your price point, but fit options, what he has available, you can go online, check out all the different sizing options, all the different prices at thehockeyshop.com. But if you really want to get into the nitty gritty and ask questions like, does it tuck well, untuck? How do I like it? What about my pants? How's it really going to fit? What level of play? This guy is here to answer the phone if you call him at 604-589-8299 or 1-800-567-7790. You got to throw that up so I can you know, hit it on the park. Yeah, softballs. All day for you, softballs. All right, folks, lots of options for chest protectors and lots of options from other brands as well. Uh, as we pan around the store, there's just an absolute ton here. And he's the guy to talk to to make sure you find something that fits not only your budget, but your game. Check them out at the hockey shop, thehockeyshop.com. Just takes a couple of bruises and then you go, uh, I think I'm going to go see Cam and, and talk about uh, a new upper body, a, a chesty, um, and just make sure that I am protected. That's all it takes. And uh, Cam is ready. He's willing. He's excited uh, to talk to you about uh, what's happening over at the hockey shop, the hockey shop.com source for sports Surrey. Let's get into our Vesna trophy predictions. You cannot say, and, and Yaroslav Halak is standing by. Sorry. And, but our green room is so amazing at in radio, the podcast that he doesn't even mind just hanging out in the green room. Uh, as we talk about this stuff, he's so comfortable. We have so much memorabilia in the green room that he's probably only halfway through uh, looking around the room. Our Vesna trophy predictions. You can't say, Andre Vasilevsky, who are you taking Kevin Woodley? So, no, I'm not taking Kevin Woodley. No? No, definitely. <laughs> Woodley doesn't have a chance. That was, that, that's top five funniest things you've said on this podcast. It's a short list. <laughs> <laughs> kind of hurt my feelings. Okay, Woodley, over to you. Come on. Oh, so, your pick? okay. Uh, well, Darren, you said we could have two, right? Yes, you can have two. I don't know if you can have two in a row, though. That's so, not so, so he's going to give me two. Right. Let's go around it's the horn. like a draft. One, you gotta, and then two. This is like a draft. Snake. You got to take one. The old ladder draft. Okay. So you know what? Hon uh, I already teased it. Uh, Honestly, I didn't think it was going to be this difficult or else I would have started it a long time ago. Well, we are difficult. <laughs> well, and you know, I've got 10 <laughs> answers for, and I'm giving, you're giving me two spots. So uh, I'm going to stick with uh, what we we're talking about before. Like I could see Mike Smith being a dark horse in this conversation. And maybe this is just the contrary in me. I have seen a whole bunch of guys uh, and publications and rankings and lists that have the Edmonton Oilers goaltending buried. Um, I know that Mike Smith is aging. And I know a lot of people look at the season he had last year when he was probably in that conversation. I can't remember if he got any votes, but he should have. Um, and they and they said it was a blip. It was the one-off that he hadn't had a year like that since 2012. So what are the chances of him repeating it at this age? And Hachi were at the Net360 camp, like rave reviews about how he looks. I saw last year as the product of a significant change he made. And because it wasn't just him finding lightning in a bottle, I saw it not only as repeatable, but I see it as something he could actually build upon because he's now had another full summer working with Adam Francilia and more time sort of taking those changes 
and Dustin Schwartz, the goalie coach in Edmonton, sort of putting elements into his game technically that match the changes he's made physically and him being able to do things, frankly, he wasn't able to do just two years ago in terms of moving around his crease. Really impressed what I what I saw. And maybe this is just recency bias, but his game against the Canucks last night, um, I could see maybe maybe it's not the Vesna, but I'm putting him in there just because so many people picked them near the bottom of the league. And I think we could be talking about Mike Smith near the top of it by the end of the season. Add on to that, if he's in Vesna Trophy contention this year, that means he's right there for Team Canada at the Olympics uh, as well, which would be a real accomplishment, would put him on back-to-back Olympic teams uh, for NHLers, which uh, kind of flies under the radar. Was he not there in 2014? I don't remember. That is embarrassing. I believe he was. Wow. No, he was. He was. He was part of the Olympic team in 2014. I keep track of this stuff. You know. You know these things. Uh, let's slide over to Hutch. Where are you in the first of your two Vesna Trophy select? Well, first off, after slagging Woody, I'll say I respect him so much that if I were a betting man, I'd probably run out today and put 100 bucks on Mike Smith because uh, I do trust with what Woody says. And we've done this enough times over the years, whether it's on the podcast or in print, uh, that I need to apologize right now to Ilias Sorokin because I'm going to pick him as my Vesna Trophy guy. Uh, every time Kiss I pick somebody... Death. It uh, it doesn't bode well for them, so we're we're giving Sorokin the Hutch curse here, but uh, you know a, a budding star coming in and playing on a outstanding defensive team uh, over on the island, and um, you know he's got a one thousand save percentage in the preseason, and we know what that means. So I'm going Sorokin. I don't mind that pick uh, because of uh, Barry Trotz and the the environment. Uh, yeah, no, for sure, and, and that's dead serious. I, I make light of it, yeah. but but he's he's a guy I look to for sure. Uh, both of my selections uh, revolve around uh, opportunity and uh, maybe making good and proving other people wrong and and taking their game to a different level. Sergey Bobrovsky, uh, Vezina Trophy winner, two thousand thirteen, two thousand seventeen. Uh, he was supposed to win it last year based on the every four year uh, theory. That didn't happen. Uh, I'm going to take him this year. He's being pushed by Spencer Knight. Uh, and when you got uh, that kind of contract, uh, that kind of expectations, and you've got that kind of pedigree, I think Sergei Bobrovsky has a bounce back year. And I will follow it. Okay. You, have, you, uh, Woody? have you considered the announcement that they're expecting their first child any day? We have a theory at Ingle Magazine that first babies eat save percentage. Oh, really? That's a lot. You're- I'm 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 going to uh, sidetrack that and just put it on the shelf. I, I don't believe in 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 those. I think his. I think it'll be. It'll just add to an extra special year. There we go. How about that? A third Vesna uh, with a first child. It's good. Uh, Ro- Robin Leonard is uh, my other selection. I get opportunity to uh, have the big contract and be the number one goaltender. Both of those happening at the same time. Uh, Robin Leonard behind uh, a defense that uh, won the Jennings Trophy last year and uh, supported the Vesna Trophy winner in Marc-Andre Fleury. I think Robin Leonard steps up and uh, is uh, a Vesna Trophy candidate for this season. So I'm going the veteran route uh, with my two Vesna picks. Uh, back to Hutch. Um, do, do, do. I've got one that I probably should pick, but I like to just go off the board. So I'm going off the board again here, guys. I can't say that he's necessarily going to get the nomination, but somebody we're going to talk about at the end of the year, everybody will be saying, has he had enough starts to justify it? Will be LB. I'll go with Laurent Brassois in Vegas for all the reasons you've um, pegged uh, that, you know, the defensive structure and the success that the team's going to have, the Jennings trophy, I think he's going to step in there and get an, enough starts to open some eyes, uh, but probably not enough starts to get the nomination. But let's see what happens. So real props for the uh, VGK blue line uh, supporting yeah, two Besna trophy candidates. In so Woody, we left you a couple softies you can go after now. Well, we in, you know that there might be a there might be a props bet already out there on Thatcher Demko after the interview with him last week, but I'm going to avoid any in goal jinx being attached to Thatcher, who I think is going to have a hell of a year. I still have question marks about this defense, and I'm going to go with the analytics. Demko actually is one of the few guys that would be above this guy on the analytics, but over the past two seasons, um, he has always been near the top. 
Uh, when I look at the clear sight adjusted numbers, I think this is a team. This will this will be predicated on the team taking a step, and maybe I don't have a great read on that. Uh, but I'm gonna I'm gonna go with uh, Igor Shishjorkin um, with the New York Rangers. Uh, he's like he's just been legit at every level, and I think if that team has a breakthrough, it'll be in large part because of him behind them. And everything we see shows that he's capable. Would Demko? I've already said how good a season I think he's going to have, and I may have put my money where my mouth is on that one. Um, so this is my way of getting three picks out of two, Darren. <laughs> okay, I'll follow it up. Cal Peterson, same philosophy. If the LA Kings have a uh, breakthrough year and and kind of do that big jump up the standings that most teams tend to do, uh, if they're going to be ahead of schedule, then uh, I'll go Cal Peterson. But uh, uh, Yaroslav Halak uh, waiting in our green room and you're taking his partner, uh, which means great support from Yaroslav Halak. Uh, I think that's uh, that's also very positive. Oh, in, in all the places that he's been in in Montreal, St. Louis and Boston, Vancouver, Washington, the Islanders. What was your favorite setup for Yaroslav Halak? I mean, the Bruins was good. Uh, I, I his Islander setup is kind of underappreciated in in my mind i like that uh that kit what did you like uh what he well i mean he's a, he he had the sort of slash marks in in his previous yeah. stops and i just to me they fit that bruins motif so well when he changed the slash over to sort of the bear claws cutting through the pads and yeah so i like maybe the again recency bias uh, my little pea brain doesn't remember old things but i i'm i'm a big fan i'm a big fan the, of the uh, iceberg one in um uh, Montreal for a while. He had the uh, the stripes, uh, horizontal stripes uh, in Montreal for a little bit. Kind of like in the drip he's got going to Vancouver too, but I th- I still think that yeah. uh, Boston's probably my favorite. He had some style. What do you? What about you there, Hutch? I'm, I know that you've got fast fingers. You've been you've been looking at uh, the different images. Yeah, just so that I can pretend I remember the Islander setups better than Woody. The Islander setups were awesome, but but I go with Woody as well. I mean, um, those those Brian's claw marks just morphed a little bit in Boston and they fit the Boston setup so well. Um, that was one of the best ones in the league, in my opinion. Yaroslav Halak at more than 280 wins. He's won 20 games in a season with four different teams. And today he makes his debut on the In Goal Radio podcast. Uh, the feature interview brought to you by Sensorina VR. Hutch, uh, an opportunity for uh, people to to sign up, get involved, and there's there's something new coming for us. Well, there's a few new things, guys. It's super exciting times at Sense Arena. And, and once again, we thank them for their support of the show. You'll remember that uh, not long ago, they had a sort of a global competition that uh, let people pit their skills against each other in the virtual goaltending world. And now they've just taken it to a whole new level starting today. Today is Friday, October the 8th, as we're recording this. They are starting the Global Hockey Skills Tour. It is a competition that will take place over five months, hosted virtually in five different cities around the world, leading to a big showdown. There's going to be prizes every month. Um, But the big thing is, if you manage to pull off the win, and I could see you two working really hard to get the win here, guys, you get a trip to the Stanley Cup playoffs. This isn't just a little bit of a competition that somebody's throwing together. This is a big deal and it's global and you're all working with the same drills in the same headset. It's just what a really exciting opportunity to see where you stand against everybody around the world. So I encourage everybody to head over to sensorina.com, look up the global skills challenge. We'll have a link in the show notes as well. Get involved, get a chance to compete against Darren Millard and Kevin Woodley. It's going to be really exciting. We might even have to have our own little thing that we said we would last time. We failed everybody, guys. I know, Darren, you were ready. I know. It's just Woodley. He was late. No surprise. I couldn't um, get my head. Hey, listen, out, I couldn't everybody. get my headset back from the National Hockey League team that had, you know, co-opted it on its way to me and wouldn't give it. Not my fault. The product's so good. Or you couldn't get it over all that hair. One or the other. One or the other. Okay, so that's the big deal, guys. Check out the Sense Arena skills competition. But if you don't own Sense Arena yet, we also have an awesome opportunity to do that right now. They For the next week, they have a promo going on where you can get a total of $149 off Sense Arena on top of the savings that you already get for signing up for an annual membership. 
which is 30% off the the regular monthly price. So huge savings, 30% off going annual, another $149 off as part of this promo. Just use the code IGM, that's like in goal mag, IGM promo 50. Uh, The 50 is tied to the the regular discount that you get through us. It tags on top of this one and you get the total of 149. So if you haven't tried Sense Arena yet, now's an incredible opportunity. Your season is starting. You want to get some skills work in, but you also want to get to be part of this big global competition. Check out Sense Arena Talk today. Bearing the lead there, all kinds of the discounts and opportunities. That's awesome. Yeah, well, I still think the chance to compete against Darren Millard is the lead. So chance to beat Darren Millard, like just take him out to the wood. Notice chipper. I'm too scared to get in on it at all. I'm just throwing you two. On I'm uh, I'm having trouble with my blocker. I, uh, I I admit that I'm I, I find myself uh, just struggling with that. But boy, when when there's I do not kid about this. If you haven't tried it, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna tell something that's uh, that's totally unique to Sense Arena and and the process of making saves. When you catch a puck uh, using the Sense Arena VR headset, and you look down at your glove, and then you shake the puck out, there's something cool about that. I, and, and I know it's virtual. Do you swat it away too? What's that? Do you swat it away no. as well? Maddie takes this, the paddle of the stick and Seriously? sort of whacks it away too, or the blocker. Never even thought yeah. to do that. Certainly the blocker I've seen him do. Oh, yeah. that's cool. But yeah, Good there's fun. just something about uh, about doing that. Uh, Woody, Woody, I'll send you a video of it uh, uh, just so you can see Yeah, what, I know, because I've never experienced it actually going into the glove cleanly. <laughs> <laughs> You know, you t- you talk about looking down in the virtual world at your glove there, Darren. I just this morning I saw a GoPro video of Askarov over oh, in yeah? the KHL uh, in practice, and every time he looked down at his glove where he just caught it, of course he's a lefty, so it's in the wrong hand. It was disorienting to watch the video because you see him look down, you expect to see blocker there, and it's not. Or even just in his setup, it was. Uh, it's amazing how that virtual world gets a hold of you. You guys ever want to try it? Try being uh, a, a righty just just for like ten minutes. Where where other? Absolutely, me absolutely. too. Absolutely, I think it'd be a great. No, thing I'm shaking to try. my head on this one because I have enough trouble with my proper hands. <laughs> well, let's let's put. Well, it worked for Vasilevsky. Let's put you in a spot that uh, that that works. Yeah, you're right, uh, Vasilevsky. Uh, a a, a when he grew up, a was, a, was a natural lefty. Yeah. Uh, let's put uh, Woody in his most comfortable position. That's talking to uh, National Hockey League goaltenders. Yaroslav Halak of the Vancouver Canucks, his first year with Ian Clark and company, uh, an opportunity to sit down with the newest member of the organization and talk about his journey, which includes uh, cleaning the pads, uh, making sure that uh, that he's ready to go with his uh, practice set, and uh, and then into what he's chasing uh the Olympics or career accomplishments. There's a whole lot going on in this conversation brought to you by Sensorina, Sensorina VR. It's a feature interview on In Goal Radio, the podcast brought to you by the Hockey Shop Source for Sports Story. Really happy to welcome for the first time to the In Goal Radio podcast, Yaroslav Halak, now with the Vancouver Canucks. We've talked so many times over the years. I'm always annoying you with gear questions and everything. Nice to actually get to sit down and have a longer conversation. I guess first off, like just to hop right in, you've done this before, but usually you go to teams and you settle in, like you're, you're there for three, four years. You've played with a bunch of new teams over your career. What's, the, like, what's this adjustment process like for you, Not just on the ice, but off the ice with a young family? I think uh, I think the older you get, I think easier it gets um, for you to kind of just, uh, you know, I wasn't lucky kind of to be with one team uh, or two teams all my career. So I, I changed a bunch of teams and uh, coming here, uh, me, it's a new challenge, uh, obviously. And um, I'm looking forward to kind of work uh, with Ian Clark, um, you know he's uh, he's been great for uh, other goalies in, in the past, and uh, I just want to um, kind of I wouldn't say improve, but uh, yeah, probably improve a little bit on my game, and then uh, um, you know go uh, day by day and game by game and try to help the guys. What's it like working with a new coach? You mentioned Ian. I mean, you've worked with some great ones over the years. I know Roly Melanson was a big voice early for you. Uh, last few years with Bob Asenza, one of our favorites. When you first meet a new coach, like what's the process like? Do you go back and forth on, you know, some of the things they see? Do you explain what what makes you comfortable? Um, 
just walk me through what that back and forth is like. What are you talking about? Uh, I think uh, the main thing is like I'm not 22, 23 anymore, so uh, it's hard to or harder to improve a lot, kind of, uh, uh, with my style. So I think Clarky, what he did, uh, we we talked a little bit at the beginning, and he um, he he said he wants to see uh, absorb kind of me in practices and in games and then uh if he sees something uh, that uh he, he he might think that maybe uh, I can improve this way or that way he's going to give me a suggestion and uh, it's uh, this it's up to me if I if I apply it to my game so um that's basically kind of what we talked about and um uh, this is how we're going to do things and uh, and I I said I'm I'm open to any new ideas so what do, can you give me an example? Just because like this audience is a hundred percent goalie, so you got a whole bunch of goalies listening, going like, "What kind of things?" Like, there's a lot of like, like you said, at this point in your career, there's a foundation there, and it's a foundation that's worked remarkably well for you. What are, are they? Small things? Is it like post play? What are uh, the things that you look at? Uh, it's kind of you know, I would say it's um, like you said, post maybe a post play coming to the post, uh, uh, setting yourself up uh, for next play. Um, um, you know, going uh, goal line, blue line, kind of uh, in a crease, going a uh, um, little bit faster, setting setting yourself up for a, for a shooter, and uh, so a lot of things like this, little details. You know, they always make a di- big difference uh, at the end of the game or at the end of the day. But uh, so we'll see. Uh, we had um, you know we worked a little bit in a training camp, but I know it's going to be a long season, so we just have to kind of keep. Uh, Getting better out of things and uh, keep uh, just kind of you know that foundation improve 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 that. What uh, is there a terminology that you have to learn? Like the 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 techniques are all somewhat the same. Everybody has little iterations that they do differently. But I know at the end, like sometimes there's different phrasing and different words. Like when you go to a new goalie coach, one guy just calls it a reverse. One calls it a reverse VH. I know in you know, reverse tracking is something I've heard from him where I think a lot of coaches would call it a double seal. Like, do you guys need, and it's not just him, but with any goal, new goalie coach and new voice, do you have to sort of make sure when you guys say something that you both know what each other means? Is that a process? Uh, I think he, he knows all the terms because he's been around all the goalie coaches, the different goalies, so he probably knows when someone says something or uh, something I wouldn't say new to him, but uh, uh, when he says something uh, different, uh, different terms, like you said, uh, if I if I don't know what it means, I'll just ask. You know, I think that's the simplest thing to to ask, and he'll explain it. He's uh, he's good at explaining. So, is that important though? Like, like I said, like sometimes I could say something to you, and I have something in my mind, and you hear it, and that phrase means something different to you. I don't know that it's a big deal, but I would think it'd be important as you guys build a relationship to make sure you're saying that, you know, communicating on the same, using the same words. Yeah, if, uh, like you said, if, if he says something that I, uh, I'm not 100% sure with what he means by, then I'll just, I'll just ask him. I, and then uh, he'll use a different phrase, like you said, and then I'll, I'll understand. And then if I still don't understand, he'll use a different one. And then uh, I think we, we kind of learning how you know how he works, how I work, and uh, getting on the same page as the you know training camp goes on and uh, the season approaching. Okay, so well, the other part of coming to a new team is gear, and a lot of our audience have big fans of your style over the years. You had you developed sort of an iconic look in Boston. What's that process like? The new pads, having a custom design, is it important to you to sort of come up with something that's new or different. Rather, like you're one of the few guys that. When the new model comes out, you don't come out with a stock graphic. You've always got something with some style. Um, yeah, even coming here, um, uh, what I had in Boston, those uh, you know uh, scratches and uh, bear claws. Uh, I don't think it would work here with uh, with a Canuck. So I just wanted to kind of do diff- something different again, uh, different than what I had in the past. So uh, you know the graphics that I have now, uh, they're simple. I didn't want to have, uh, you know, too much on on, on a pads on a, on a glove. So uh, I think uh, it's pretty clean, uh, simple, and 
We'll see. We'll see how it goes. I think it looks pretty good um, on the ice. Do you leave it to them to come up with ideas, or like, I mean, as a kid, did you like to design gear? Do you still like? Is that still exciting for you to come up with a new concept, or you just leave it to them and uh, run a few ideas by? I, I talk to you know. I t- always talk to Brian's, uh, um, and then uh, they'll they'll do a few designs for me. And if you know, if I if I if I like the design, I'll tell them. Or if I like some some parts of the design i'll you know they'll change uh what i ask uh, them to change so we always come up with the designs together and uh i mean it worked it worked so far um so um you know this one like i said this one uh, i just wanted something simple different and and uh, we'll see how it works for me we've written a little bit about the practice pads i noticed you got a set that's a practice on them here um, your pads always look so clean in games too. Do you clean them? Do you have somebody, like, do you keep your game set super clean or is that just a function of the ones in practice are taking most of the pucks and getting dirtier? Uh, you know what? I, I clean, I clean them, uh, you know, I don't know how often, but, uh, I clean my, my game pads, my practice pads, uh, not so much now. I haven't cleaned them yet. Uh, I don't think they need to be so for now. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I just, I just like that clean look. I don't like the, uh, you know, uh, puck marks on a, on a game stuff. Uh, you know, people always ask me, how do I keep them so clean or, or if it's a brand new, uh, uh, set, you know, and stuff like that. When did you start doing that? Cause, uh, it's, it's funny cause it's something that I, I think I knew about. I may have asked Jaws back in the day. We have maybe even talked about it at one point, but every once in a while we get that question. Is that just something you developed over time or has it always been sort of a habit for you? And there's probably a lot of goalies out there like, what does he use? Uh, I, uh, I, when I was in Montreal, they, uh, uh, the trainers would do it for me uh, without even asking. So wow. if, if the gear got uh, you know, too uh, dirty or too many puck marks, they would just clean them. And then, uh, and then uh, when I got to St. Louis, I uh, started doing it myself and... Uh, at first, uh, I don't know, I think I used like a locker thinner to kind of clean them, which uh, smells, you know, everybody knows the smell. It smells crazy. You get a little bit too high doing that. Uh, but I, uh, when I got to Boston, our, one of my trainers, he got me, uh, the, it, it, I think the name uh, of the product is, uh, I'm not sure right now, uh, something off. It's like a like a household cleaning it is, product. It is, it is. So you, you kind of use a sponge, one of those. I always use the one of those. Uh, uh, what is that, uh, Mister Cleaner? Those strong the little ones, white, the white yes, ones, the white ones. And it magic works. erasers, like the Mister Clean those magic ones, erasers. Yes, I use I use those ones and and the product, and and it works. Yeah, I actually I saw it in one of the hockey stores here in Vancouver. So look good feel good play good is that just part of it or is it just become a habit no i i I don't look at it this way i just uh um i just uh like that clean look even um with the designs uh, you know i I always like uh, more white than uh than the color stuff now where did you come up with the idea of practice pads because i gotta be honest it makes so much sense goalies use practice gloves to sort of protect their hands sometimes with a little more you know with just a little more padding but the idea of, you know, not breaking down your game set with all the shots you see in practice, it makes a ton of sense. And yet we haven't, like, you're, you're a trendsetter here, but we haven't seen enough guys follow it. You uh, think people get there? So uh, when, I, when I was in, uh, in St. Louis, I, I would have practice uh, just gloves. So blocker, you, you know, you can't really do too, too much or, or a, big, a big change over there. But uh, for a uh, for catching glove, uh, you can... More put more padding, but then, but then uh, you're sacrificing the. Uh, you can't really squeeze the glove, so yeah. a lot of pucks got out. So um, so and then uh, I kind of came up with the idea: uh, why not have practice set, and then I have game set. So I'll just save uh, save the game set for games, and then practice it. You know, whatever. I just uh, use it in practice, and that's it. Uh, and uh, and then. Um, you know, that way uh, the game set lasts longer. And then I know practice it, you see a, a lot of pucks in practice. So it breaks down easily and 
you know, you just need more, more practice sets, but then you have less game sets. So it's, it seems, like I said, it makes perfect sense because now your game set stays in, you, you probably break it in a little bit and get it just how you want it. And then it just stays there. Yeah, it ca- you know, it kind of does. It's just the only, only bad part is like when uh, after the games, you know, the gear is wet, uh, you're traveling from city to city. So it stays in a, in a bag for, you know, a couple of hours or, or more than that. So it, it still gets softer. But it's still, it's not as bad as when you use the same set in games and practices. We talked earlier about technique and, and, and new voices and things like that. But I wanted to ask you about sort of your foundation, what you see as your keys. Because you've had a remarkable career to this point, chasing 300 wins in the NHL, which is a big milestone. When you come to a new team and they're asking you what, you know, what, what do you like? What do you think are your foundation, your anchors? What would that answer be? Like, what do you think is the key to your success to this point? I think, uh, obviously, I, I'm not the biggest goalie, so um, I got to uh, come with a different stuff. So I think uh, one of the things that I'm not saying I do good or, 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 or better than anyone, but it's just uh, uh, maybe I developed uh, as I was younger and uh, as I was growing up, uh, reading the game, uh, um, kind of, seeing the play uh developing you know and then uh i'm just trying to play uh, them bigger than i'm actually i am you know uh, i'm just trying to have high stance uh i'm not trying to get too low uh you know in my stance and uh, that way i look bigger than I, my actual size when you say not get too low is that like sort of keeping your feet under you a little bit more not getting too wide or is it more about just sort of uh, making sure you keep that chest up and, I, th- and I think high. that's the main thing that I, I try to keep my chest up you know kind of like torso with a chest up that way you know you're not making yourself way too small and uh and then even uh even you know some goalies um and I get it because everybody has a different style. So, uh, you know, you, you you can't copy this guy or that guy. Uh, everybody has a unique style. So for me, I, I just, uh, even uh, even my legs, I don't bend them too much, you know, kind of. In occasions, you know, on occasions I do. But, uh, yeah, I'm just trying to uh, maximize my, uh, my height out there. So... Do you pay attention to other goalies that have success? I don't, do you take pride in the success you've had, both both in the NHL and on the international stage, at five foot eleven at a time when you know, I, there was a point where Jonathan Bernier a few years ago, who's another goalie who's had a good career under six foot, like he wondered if if the draft was tomorrow, would he even get picked? Like the trend is so away from it, and you guys continue to have success in a league where most teams are chasing six foot five. Do you take pride in that? Do you watch other small, smaller goalies? I mean, there is not that many out there uh, left in the league. Uh, the trend is uh, going with bigger goalies, uh, uh, which is fine. I, I'm not sure if I would be uh, drafted if the draft were to, was tomorrow. Uh, I think I think if some team uh, would take somebody uh, five five eleven or six feet tall, uh, he would have to be... Uh, Probably better than the guy that is six three, way better than him. Uh, but uh, yeah, I just uh, there's just no mar- just, there's no margin for error if you're smaller. Yeah, like mean, it I, feels I, like you don't get a, I, the you know, chances. I, I don't that really guy. look at it this way because uh, you don't know how how is it to be six three, six four, six five. So you have to uh, you have to kind of uh, play with what you got. Um, I mean, uh, if I, if you're five eleven, just try to do your best uh, with your height and uh, and kind of try to play to your strengths, you know? Yeah, and I guess I shouldn't have said no margin for error in terms of you playing, probably just in terms of other te- teams looking at a goalie. Like, the guy who's 6'5 is going to get more chances, probably, than the guy who's trying to survive at 5'10", 5'11". At least it feels like that sometimes in the NHL these days. Yeah, I, I, yeah maybe, maybe uh, like you said, maybe that's the trend uh, that has been, like, uh, lately uh, with bigger taller goalies uh you know they take uh, more more space in the net um I, like i said i'm just trying to play with what i got uh try to have fun i think that's the most important thing for for anybody player goalie whoever you are you just have to have fun and uh and then uh, you know the rest of it what we fall what uh like what do you look like i know like i mentioned 300 wins that is a big milestone i don't know if that's something you you're looking at or thinking about at all 
Um, what about the Olympics? Like you've had a lot of success with Slovakia, obviously here as well in 2010, um, had a good run. Like, do you, are you hoping to be a part of that? Is that part of your goals when you look at what a great season for Yaroslav Halak looks like this year? Uh, I, you know, one of my goals is, uh, the 300 wins. Uh, I, I want to get that, uh, uh, it's just my personal kind of achie- achievement that I want to, uh, accomplish. And, uh, and then, uh, we'll, we'll see how everything goes. I just want to take it day by day. Uh, I'm not look. I'm not looking at the big picture now. I'm just going day by day, trying to build my game, uh, trying to, um, work hard in practices and, uh, and, uh, stay in the moment. Kind of I'm, stay, I'm asking you to yeah. look at the future and that's stay, not what goalies do. Stay in the moment. Do. It's still, uh, Olympics, they're still far away. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, a lot of things could happen in between now and then. And like I said, I'm just trying to uh, enjoy more and stay in the moment kind of day by day and, and uh, you know, get ready for a season. I think that's the, the, the you know, the main thing for everybody in the locker room, for myself, uh, uh, including coaching staff. They, they want to get us ready for a season. We want to get ready. And, uh, you know, we just have to go day by day, day by day, you know. When you think about international, I won't ask you to look forward to the Olympics, but the success you've had, whether it's at the Olympic Games or I know it was Team Europe technically, but that was a big tournament at the World Cup, had success there. Do you see yourself like, do you, do you think about the fact that there are probably young Slovakian goaltenders that are looking up to Jaroslav Halak as a guy who made it is playing at the national hockey league like do you see that role model status for yourself back home do you feel that at all i don't really look at it this way uh I'm putting you on the spot there yeah sorry i don't really look at it this way i i uh if someone uh looks up to me um you know that that's great i mean uh but at the same time uh i just want to feel good about my game and about myself out there and and like i say you just have to enjoy it uh you never know when uh when it's your last game and uh and you just have to, like I said, go day by day, game by game, and uh, just work hard in practices. And I think if you if you do that, uh, I think it'll be uh, successful in games. Did you have a guy growing up? Like when did when did you become a goalie? You you mentioned uh, before we started recording that your son's not a goalie. But what drew you to the position? Uh, I I don't know. I just uh, I wanted to be a goalie since I was three. So uh, three years old. Yeah. Um, really? Yeah. I don't know. Uh, just uh, probably the gear. You know the masks, uh, stopping the pucks. Uh, I, I think I think that's what uh, made me be a goalie uh, and uh, made me want to be a goalie. And um, I just when I was growing up, uh, there was uh, there was there was different goalies, you know. And and um, I, I always like Cujo. Cujo, uh, you know, he wasn't the uh, the, the biggest guy, uh, tallest guy out there, but he always competed on every puck. He would always try to stop it no matter what. And uh, I think he was kind of like the, you know, obviously Patrick Roy, um, Martin Brodor, all these guys, if you... So you were watching NHL guys as opposed to maybe guys back in, in the league back uh, home? You know, we had highlights every Saturday. Uh, we had highlights on a TV. I think it was like at 8 in the morning or 8.30 in the morning. There was a TV show called Power Week. So they showed all the highlights, a big save. So, and, and I always waited for those saves. So, so w- when did you get to finally put like, the, you're, you're not going to be a goalie at three. You may have wanted to, no. when, when did you finally get into the net? And, uh, I, when I, uh, you know, like playing, playing in France, uh, street hockey, I always be, the goalie? I would be a goalie, not always, but I was, I was a goalie more, more often than not. And, uh, and then when I was eight, uh, just a friend of mine, uh, he just told me if I, cause he was already playing, if I want to try it, you know, on the ice and. And I did, and uh, and uh, I, I'm still playing. Love it, love it. When did it become so? Like, when did you have your first goalie coach? All especially back then. Like, times have changed. Now we, you would have nowadays. You go out at eight, and you probably have a goalie coach. When did you, when did you get your first one? Yeah, we had. Uh, I <laughs> when I go back, you know, we always had a goalie coach, but we only had uh, goalie practice once a week. I would say so. It was. It's still and not bad for it, that. No, it's still not bad. But we had way too many guys out there, you know. So it was it was really hard. There was different stations. I, I would say there was like a six, six to eight stations. Uh, we each had two or three goalies. So it, it was 
it, it was always challenging, but... Uh, but the fact you had a goalie program, like at the time, that would be ahead of the curve for a lot of places. I'm trying to do the math on when, like, you know, like this is goalie coaches for kids is a relatively new phenomenon. Yeah, I, but I don't, I don't think we had like goalie coach or goalie practices uh, at my age. Uh, I think it started a little bit later when, you got when I was like, uh, I would say 14. Okay. So in the meantime, uh, I was on my own and... Uh, and I had my power week. That there, that was your coach. That just was watching, my, yeah. And I tried, to, I just tried to copy the guys. You know, love it. Was there a point where you went from copying the guys on power week to thinking the NHL is a realistic goal or something where it's like, hey, like this is something I could do yeah. for a long time? No, I, I, I was. I, it might sound crazy, but I was saying this. I was saying that since I was three, that I want to be a goalie, I want to be an NHL. So, and then, uh, you know, I, my dream uh, came true. So uh, maybe I'm, I'm one of the lucky ones that uh, I was able to get in NHL um, and then uh, be able to stay in NHL for as long as I am for, uh, now. One of those guys on Power Week was Patrick Wasso. What does it mean when you get picked by the Montreal Canadiens? Was it like we're, Without knowing the situation, you are. Were you like, were you at the draft, or were it was it something no, where you found no, out later? Because uh, that's kind of changed, right? Uh, so we had um, we had under 18s. So I was in, it was in Russia, and we finished second. I was named the best goalie at, uh, in the tournament that year, and uh, and then I was told like I should be second or third round, and uh, and then I was watching. I was watching online first five rounds. My I didn't see my name, so I just stopped watching. And then, um, and then Montreal picked me in a nine, nine round. So I, I was disappointed. I, I'm not going to lie. I was disappointed to be picked that late. But at the same time, I was happy that the team picked me. But I still had, you know, a long way to go. Really, Melanson, talk to me. Because I know he was here. Obviously, I got to know him a little bit in Vancouver. Big fan of him as a goalie coach and, and as a person. Um, what role did he play? Because I know he was a big fan of yours as well, talking to him all those years ago when he was with the Canucks. And what role did he play in sort of trans helping you make that transition over here and, and establish yourself as a National Hockey Leaguer? Well, he um, he would come to uh, my agent um, camps. Like, he had camps every every summer for a couple of weeks. So he would come and train goalies. And so I trained with goalies. Back home? Uh, he was back home. I think I trained with Rolly two times back home. Uh, for a couple of weeks, um, so uh, when I was 16, so for, I think first time I met him when I was 16, my English at the time was not the best. So, uh, but I just tried to follow the, you know, kind of um, the goalies or that already did the drills before or, or that were that would already played in uh, junior league in Canada. So, um, but he kind of he kind of taught me how to play big, you know. So that's what I mentioned before. Try, yeah. try to maximize my uh, my height uh, on the ice. So he kind of did that for me. And ever since, you know, like when I was drafted by Montreal, then he started working with me in uh, in camps. And he was he was kind of the main guy that helped me a lot to get to the level where I needed to be. You've played with so many like uh, good goalie coaches. Have been a part of your career. Also playing partners. I mean. I know in Montreal, it was it, a lot of the media and outside focus was on, you know, Yarrow or, or Carey Price at, towards the end. But, you know, you played with him as he was coming up. You played with Tuka Rask, who's, in my mind, a first ballot Hall of Famer. Sometimes I don't know what the Boston people are thinking when they talk about him. But, like, do you pick, like, do you, are you a guy that when you have a new playing partner or, like, are you picking stuff off of each other? Do you run stuff by each other? Does that relationship, anything that's, bled into your game just based on a relationship with a guy and seeing something um, they do? Well, you know, playing playing Boston, playing with Tukes, um, you know, kind of watching him uh, play games and uh, in practices, uh, he, you know, he's one of the one of the best goalies in uh, NHL. He's been for a long time and uh, I just, uh, you know, he uh, really like watch him in game, sometimes he was, uh, you know, you could pick up a lot of stuff from him, and uh, so even like I like watching different goalies out there when they are when they're playing. So I always watch uh, 
maybe what I can do differently, what I can improve. So, uh, and same thing with you, because I, I would always watch. Last one. Um, it's not quite back to normal because the media is not in the locker room. So you guys have a little sanctuary there. You don't have to, you only have to put up with one of these this year, as opposed to me bugging you all year round. So you're lucky. Um, most guys probably need a bonus to have to put up with me coming to Vancouver, but just to have stand fans back in this, like how tough was last year? Um, just yeah. such a, a unique season. How tough was it for you? I know there was a point where you had to be away from the team. I, I caught COVID, missed time. Like just how tough has the past couple of years been? Especially for goalies, we're creatures of habit and routine and it's all been taken and sort of changed. Yeah, it's been, uh, it's been tough. Uh, not only uh, in sport, but uh, in normal life for everybody. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's uh, speaking of hockey again. Um, it was it wasn't easy going to the rinks, uh, knowing that there, there's gonna gonna be no fans. Uh, so you know, sometimes you would you, you know you would have normal game before, and even if you didn't have the energy, uh, but the fans created the energy for you. It kind of pushed you uh, to play better. So um, uh, that was kind of hard. Uh, as the season went on, you know, we had a little bit of fans, uh, not in Canada, but in the, right in the States, there. they opened up things. So we had a little bit of fans. Then I, then I got COVID, then I missed, uh, uh, you know, a few weeks Then I came back, then I didn't play. So, uh, I was, uh, it was challenging for everybody, uh, you know, for families, for, um, anybody, uh, you know, working at the, at the ranks, uh, you know, so. But you know things are kind of getting back to normal. So hopefully, hopefully we can uh, we can say in a couple of months from now, like or whatever that is, things are somewhat normal. So nice and nice to have fans back here too. For yeah. like, I mean, you, have you probably talked to the guys that didn't have it at all last yeah. year? Here, that makes it, a difference. It, eh? Even for me, even for me, uh, playing the one game. You know, you only have fifty percent of the people in uh, in stands, but you 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 feel it right away. You feel the difference. And you feed off that energy. Yeah, you, it's so much better. It's not quiet at the rink. Uh, you don't hear the coaches yelling at the guys all the time or referees. So, uh, it is it is nice to see the people back in the stands, and hopefully, uh, we can uh, have hundred percent pretty soon over here, and uh, that would be. That would be unreal for, especially for the guys that had zero fans at all last year and even year before. So um, I just, I just hope uh, everything uh, will work out. Well, it's nice to have you here in Vancouver. I really appreciate you taking the time to do this and join us on Ingo Radio. Uh, it's good to catch up. And like I said, I'll let you off the hook for the rest of the year, but I appreciate this, Yaro. All right. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. For clarification, because I use the product to get rid of stains around doors and all this kind of stuff. Uh, what Yaroslav Lak was talking about when he's uh, cleaning his uh, his game set, it's goo off. And they have they have a couple of different lines of it, but goo, G-O-O, and off. And uh, it'll take care of uh, any type of stains, including hard stuff or just puck marks, well, you, whatever you want. Well, you got to be careful here, Darren, because I just looked it up and there appears to be a uh, an, an actual goo off and then there's a goof off. So is that a, is that yes. a rip off or that's me? Oh. No, that's me. That's my website, but thanks for it. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll take the, uh, the site visit. If you click on that there, well, I mean, I, wanna, I swear to God, there's a goo gone and there's a goof off. <laughs> hey, just, um, Use with caution. Yes. If anybody out there is listening to the podcast and deciding they're going to clean their pads, uh, we have tried it with the Mr. Clean Magic Eraser with a little bit of alcohol-based um, hand sanitizer. Works, but with all this new digital printing technology on different brands, I would just exercise extreme caution. We haven't tested it under those circumstances. I'm not saying it doesn't work, but just be cautious if, as you're well, using Well, I think this the one on thing pads. that you have to be really careful, not just the digital printing. I think on the Bowers, there's an actual, like there's a layer there to the point where like those things, we've actually cleaned them up after two years of use and you can make them look brand new on the face of the pad. Um, but if you're in a, a traditional cut and sew pad, uh, you have to be really careful with color areas and color zones because uh, it doesn't yeah. take much to all of a sudden your bright red stripe looks pink or faded um, cause you've wiped it with the wrong product. So, you know, I don't want parents getting mad at us cause they've gone and tried the wrong product, but 
pretty fun to sort of get into it with Yaro. We've had that question before. I think we've answered it before because we got the answer from Jaws that he actually does clean his pads on a regular basis. But kind of neat to get the origin story there. And I've we already shared photos on Ingle um, uh, Instagram account, Ingle Media Instagram account of uh, sort of the practice label on his pads and the fact that he actually has practice pads. One of the few guys in the show with that. So yeah, it was fun. We didn't didn't mention it too much in here, but. You did allude to Chris Joswiak. Uh, people should go back and listen to the the old podcast with Chris because there's a lot of good Halak content in there that fleshes out. What episode out was that? That, that was there. a long time ago, and it was a long. Time I, I got to go back Way and listen back to that. In the old days. It was fascinating uh, listening to Jaws. I, I I didn't know him then, and and now I feel like we're we're best buddies. I, how, I used the how about mis- episode three with Thatcher Demko and Chris Joswiak together. That's how far back, 137 how about you episode? episodes. That's how about I know how to Google? That's incredible. Uh, I use the Mr. Clean Magic Eraser on my old uh, CCM Retroflex pads, just on the white parts. And that part worked out well. But there is, I, I don't know which company sells it, but there is a like a, a pad cleaner solution and we've uh, used pad. yeah we've used it and um uh, we have it and you it, it's the same sort of rules you can take it and put it on a bower and it will turn it like a new pad but you put it on like an, a traditional cut and sew gen pro on a colored part and it, it has the risk of fading it right away okay so if you use it and it works thank us if you use it and it doesn't we warned you is that enough for legal Hutch, you're you're our conscience here. Uh, is that is that enough uh, for for legal? Uh... Uh, I think I've got a meeting with the CFO later, and I'll ask her if she can take it to the uh, our corporate council. And it's actually it's it, it's actually a product by Nash, and it comes with two little white pads that almost look like Mister Clean. It's actually called Puck Out, and it's made by Nash Sports. They make a lot of sort of accessories, especially well for all players, but also for for goalies. It's it's, it's literally Puck Out Puck Mark Remover. And it is a miraculous product, but again, be very careful when you use it on colored Gen Pro or traditional cut and sew colored portions. Uh, congratulations to Curtis McElhaney. Announces his retirement. Uh, goes out as a two-time Stanley Cup champion, Woody. Yeah, and uh, we, we kind of had an inkling this was coming. Um, I think he actually kind of quietly announced it. I saw it on social media somewhere like last week, but the big official announcement through the NHL and NHLPA this week. So congratulations to Curtis. Call me back, Curtis. Uh, let's get you on the pod again to talk about those last couple of years. We've had some conversations like just getting speaking about Vasilevsky and how he's like he's like the new Gretzky, right? We're not allowed to you couldn't pick him in hockey pools in the day no. and you can't pick Vasilevsky yeah. as your resident trophy winner. Uh, Curtis has some great stories about just how remarkable a goalie he is, as well as, uh, you know, his own career path that we hope to share with you uh, in the near future. Not a bad way to go out, eh? Two time Stanley Cup champion. Uh, I, I just thought that his resiliency is something that needs to be uh, really passed on to to the goaltending world uh not just uh in, in coming up through the ranks but then mid career and how he found his footing and really blossomed into one of those valued backups and uh in the Toronto Maple Leafs it was a real loss when he left the organization well, in the year he had in Carolina, I mean, we forget that was only a few years ago with with the Carolina Hurricanes that he was the guy that got them in, you know, stepped up in the playoffs and and when Mrazek got hurt and sort of got them through the rounds. I, I still argue to this day they should have kept rolling with him and they might have they might have advanced even further. So uh just another reminder, we have a lot of like this is a guy who had a potential career ending injury, as you said, Darren, halfway through, and we've had that conversation with him. Episode 28 of the Ingo Radio podcast featured Curtis McElhenney. A lot of that mid-career revival that he experienced uh, while he was with the Columbus Blue Jackets. So hope to revisit some of those stories and then get caught up on the last couple of years and what's next for Curtis McElhenney in the near future here on the Ingo Radio podcast. Played so many years uh, in the National Hockey League, and uh, I apologize to Curtis. I never did figure out how to spell his last name like without sitting there and looking at it. Couldn't do it. Could uh, barely even got close. I have to write it so it just became second nature. Really? I have, I have to Google yeah. it. <laughs> it's it's funny. Um, by the way, it's uh, M C E L H I N N E Y. I got the Curtis part right, but uh, but then I then I kind of struggled for a little bit. Hey, uh, the Yaroslav Halak conversation, Woody. That was a lot of fun to listen to. 
and hopefully the start of many more as teams start coming through uh, here, Vancouver. Um, like I said, it's been a tough couple of years in terms of having to do everything over Zoom and from a distance. It's always great when you can sit down and look them in the eyes. Uh, you talked about it there in that Saturday show that he talked about, the highlight show, when you said you could hear the excitement and how he kept going back. His eyes popped when he started talking about that. You could see that excitement and it's nice to be back in rooms. Socially distanced, I have a an extended microphone cord for our visitors um, and I'm in a mask and double vaccinated and we're being safe. Um, but hopefully an opportunity to sit down with more guys around the league as they start coming through town when the regular season starts next week. And keep an eye on Smith, Sorokin, Bobrovsky, Brassois, Demko, and Leonard. Those are our Vesna Trophy picks. Best you, Sherkin. You don't get an extra one. You don't get. I had. Sh- I picked Shishter. Oh, did you? He you didn't mention oh, it. was a second, to be okay, fair. Sorry. To Woody's defense. Thank you. To be fair. I didn't think Woody had any defense around him. And that's why he blames all those goals. Uh, uh, he's probably got the best defense in the league we just can't check uh, it keep out. an eye on, the, on those names uh, for anybody to win the Vesna outside of uh, Andre Vasilevsky uh, thanks to uh, Yaroslav Alak thanks to Cam over at the Hockey Shop source for Sports Surrey the Hockey Shop thanks to Sense Serena VR and uh, to the co-founders of In Goal Magazine David Hutchison and Kevin Woodley and of course to you the listener uh, we will chat with you again and when we do it will be into the 2021-2022 National Hockey League regular season. Be well and make those saves. 